Well, I have my favorites here. These are diamonds and I use diamonds for my research. So, you know, the museum is great for reference material, but it doesn't just sit there and we just don't do anything about it. Actually, we do active research. So my area of expertise is diamonds. And when I first took the position a few years ago, I was just stunned by this collection of uh, micromounts. Well, micromounts for diamonds is already pre pretty big in size. And I opened several drawers and you have this entire two columns here full of diamonds. And when I saw these drawers here specifically, it was full of diamonds, purple to pink in color. And well, guess what? I work on pink diamonds. So that's when I took the position, I actually look at those diamonds and took a bunch out and now they are ready to be analyzed and hopefully be published on. And the great thing about this collection in particular is that the collector was really specific about um, what he wanted, meaning that he classified them sometimes by color, sometimes by locality, uh, by shape, so this is really well organized, which is perfect for case study. Actually, I could even do like some, some research on the morphology of diamond thanks to this amazing collection. So I can show you a few of those pink diamonds, for example. I probably took the best ones out for my research, actually, but you can see this little guy, for example, is a kind of purple octahedron. Let me look on the back. It doesn't say where it comes from, but again, it says um, traversing glide planes, lamellar growth. And that's exactly what pink diamonds are about. It's actually the pink color is not homogeneous in the diamond, they're in lamellae. And this collector all, already on the rough diamond was able to notice that. per off collection. This collection, yes, is like tens of thousands of minerals, not only diamonds, so it was collecting gold and like everything from different localities. I have several interests, research interests. The first one that I began working on uh, when I was um, a postdoc back at the Smithsonian was the color of diamonds. I was working on pink and blue diamonds. Pink, uh, because for many years we have been asking ourselves the questions where the pink color comes from. The answer is we still don't know and people have been working on that for over 40 years now. Uh, we're getting closer and closer to finding the answer though and we noticed that in some of those pink diamonds uh, the pink lamellae are actually twin planes that are due to uh, plastic deformation and we know that the default the effects responsible for the pink color is within those uh, twin planes. But again, the exact nature, we don't know. Most likely it's related to some kind of nitrogen vacancy impurity, which is kind of classic, typical of diamonds. But we, we just don't know. So I'm still working on, on those. And this collection is going to be very helpful because some of them, I know the locality. And again, it looks like, depending on where the pink diamond comes from, the, the color is kind of different. For example, Argyle diamond in Australia behave much differently than um, pink diamonds from other localities. Uh, I was working on blue diamonds as well and this time it was for the uh, boron content. The boron is the impurity that creates the, the blue color in diamonds and it's really difficult to look at the content of boron in a diamond because it's so small, the amount is so small that classical methods you can't detect the boron in it. So we're trying to do that and uh, another uh, of my research interests is more about the geology of the diamond, um, meaning trying to understand uh, what the diamond can tell you about the environment it was it formed in the first place, meaning that diamonds come from very deep inside the earth. They are uh, formed in the, the earth mantle and diamonds are actually the only uh, mineral that comes back to the surface, completely preserved, completely intact. For example, another very typical mineral of the, uh, of the mantle is peridot. But peridot, when it comes back to the surface in peridotite through basaltic eruption, it changes structure. So it doesn't give you enough clues 
to, uh, it doesn't you give you perfect clues into the, the mental. So that's, that's what I'm trying to study as well. And again, this collection might be a really good thing for me because I will know the locality of some of those, uh, of those diamonds, meaning I can look into diamonds from a very specific mine with specific geology condition, for example, possible subduction area, possible place under some very specific cratons, such as like the South African cratons and things like that. So, you know, I can pull more drawers and show you how many diamonds there are in this collection. It's, it's really unbelievable. And we have some really rare colors as well. We don't have that many blues, but we have uh, the rare green diamonds. And the green color is due to irradiation, natural irradiation. And right now we can't make the difference between uh, green diamonds, um, where the color comes from irradiation in a lab versus irradiation in a geologic environment. So again, really good uh, material for, for study. I can show you this one here. It's not green, but it's kind of big, you know, like we say, it's micromounts, but look at this one, it's like over a centimeter across. That's a big diamond, and when I look at the shape, I didn't study it, but most likely that might be a type 2 diamond. I think I got the best one out there. Yeah, so this one is fun. But sometimes they're not only single crystals, they can be intergrowth, twins. Some diamonds actually look like flowers sometimes when you look close at them, spheres, depending on, on the growth rate, for example, like you will have a cuboid diamond versus a sphere versus a very nice octahedron.